Hi, hi, hello, hope everyone is well. Okay, so last time we talked about the key idea in a homomorphism is that it's determined by its action on a basis. So naturally the check-in talks about that. Let's see. We have a map that uh, it sends um, uh, x plus 1 sends the quadratic polynomials in such, to, the, to the two tall vectors in such a way that x plus 1 uh, maps under the, under the function f to 0, 2 that x maps under the function f to uh, minus 1, minus 1, and that um, x squared under the function f maps to uh, 1, 1, 1. Okay. And I hope that a person sees that these three are, are just arbitrary. I mean, I, I just made them up. They're just supposed to be any old two tall vectors. All right, then uh, we're asked, for example, what happens to f of minus x squared? And, uh, of course, this is uh, just going to be the negative of this. That is a homomorphism. One of the properties is that if you multiply by a scalar, then the outcome come is multiplied by a scalar, too. That is, f of r, f of r, v, is r, f of v. So I should just take minus 1 times 1, 1. All right, and then let's see, number two is uh, not much harder. It's f of 1 plus x plus x squared. And a person sees here that uh, x plus 1 and x squared, so I'm taking the sum of these two, and again, the, the whole definition of homomorphism is that it should map the sum of 1 plus x and x squared to the sum of the two outputs f of uh, v1 plus v2 is f of v1 plus f of v2. So here we go. I'm just simply adding 0, 2 to uh, 1, 1 and getting, what, 1, 3, I hope. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so the idea here is set, I hope. Then a person says, uh, what is f of, um, let's see, it's going to be... Uh, 5 minus x plus 2x squared. And so the idea is we simply want to find a, b, c so that 5 minus x plus 2x squared is equal to a times the first vector C times the a B times the second vector, and C times the third vector. All right, and uh, again, a person can set up the linear system and apply Gauss's method, and, and that's always a fallback in the cases where you can't quite see what to do here. But in this case, it seems to me a person can see what to do, because there's only one x squared on both sides, so it must be that C is 2. And uh, let's see, there is uh, only one a constant term on both sides, so it must be that a is 5. And with c is 2 and a is 5, I get that 5x and what makes minus x? b is minus 6. So it's just a matter then that is to say I have to represent, have to represent the given input with respect to the given basis. Whoops. <laughs> given basis. Okay, so now then f of 5 minus x plus 2x squared is just simply going to be 5 times, don't want to lose it there, 5 times 0, 2, and that 5 is this 5. And I forget, b is minus 6 times uh, minus 1 minus 1. And c is, uh, c is, c, there it is, c is 2. 2 times 1, 1. And uh, so mine sits, I get uh, 8. And uh, 10 uh, plus 6 plus 2, 18. Okay, so if you know, if, if you know what is the action of the function on the basis, then all you got to do is uh, find the coordinates of the given input with respect to the basis 
and just drop them right in and, and, and the rest is arithmetic. Okay, so extending linearly is, uh, is a computational scheme that we don't have to express the function somehow uh, on, on, on all the space at once. We can just express the function in a couple of places, namely on the basis, and then the rest just follows immediately. Okay, we saw the handiness of that last time. All right, so uh, ready to move on to the next, ready to move on to the next step then. So uh, we are thinking about here the range space and the null space. So um, uh, going to do, uh, you know, going to do them as two, they're, they're tied together, so going to do them together as two, two parts of a whole. So uh, the first thing is that under homomorphism, the image of any subspace of the domain is a subspace of the codomain. In particular, the image of the entire space, the, the range of the homomorphism, is a subspace of the codomain. All right, and the book has the proof, but as, as, so hap as so often happens in here, I'm going to instead do an example that I hope gives a person insight into what, what the proof has to say, and then at that point, going through the proof is just a question of recognizing what, what the I's and J's are. Okay, so here's my example. I took a map from the, from the plane, R2, to the 2x2 two two matrices. Oops, my, my pointer's in the way. To the 2x2 two two matrices. And it's just some crazy map. It's not supposed to be anything particularly interesting. It, uh, uh, just, just some crazy numbers that are not too crazy. So a person can actually read them. I check in that. It's a linear map. It's perfectly routine. And then uh, I'm going to pick a subspace of the domain. So a subspace of the plane, for example, would be the x-axis, the, the uh, multiples of 1, 0. It's easy to see that when you apply this function to the x-axis, what you get is o o you range over all possible a's. So you'll, uh, you, could, you always have zeros for b's, but you could have a 1 for the a's, you could have a 2 for the a's, you could have a 3 for the a's. So you range over all possible a's, but you take the b's to be 0, and this is the result. And that's, that's a subspace of the codomain, and it's pretty clear that it's closed under addition. Let's say if you add a pair of 2 by 2 matrices, each of which have zeros on the bottom row, then you get a 2 by 2 matrix that has a zero in the bottom row. And similarly, if you multiply a 2 by 2 matrix that has zeros on the bottom row by a number, 17, then you get a, a 2 by 2 matrix that has zeros on the bottom row. Another subspace of R2 is, is, is the entire plane is R2 itself. So, uh, so what happens when you apply this function over all possible A's and B's? Well, it seems to me clear that what happens when you, when you vary the A's is you get components of this kind here. There's an A there, there's an A there. You take C1 to be A, and you're, you're getting all possible. So this is the contributor that happens by varying the A's over all possible real number A's. And likewise, when you vary over all possible real number B's, you get contributors of a B there, a 2B there, and a B there. So that's written this way, where you vary over all possible B's. So this will be the subspace of the 2 by 2 matrices. It'll be those matrices that have this form. It's clear this is just a basis, right, for the, for the, for the, uh, for the outcome. This is the, you get all possible matrices that have this form. Right, so it's a two-dimensional subspace of the four-dimensional space of 2 by 2 matrices. Uh, just uh, just another example here is that uh, for an, if you take the angle theta, then the function that rotates vectors counterclockwise to the angle theta is a linear map, and we, we've talked about that before. In the domain, the plane, each line through the origin is a subspace. The image of that line is so you start with oh there I am you start with a uh, you, you start with a subspace it's a, a line let's say that's at a 30 degree angle and you rotate it by some theta uh, imagine that theta is 20 degrees so now you have a line that's at a 50 degree angle everything in that line the entire subspace all rotates together so if you imagine adding this vector in the in the subspace to this vector in the subspace well when you rotate you're adding this vector in the subspace to this vector in the subspace. So the image of the subspace is a subspace. The range space, then, is the image of the entire space. 
So it's the special case of the previous result that takes the, uh, takes the subspace to be the entire space, takes the subspace of V to be the entire space. I, I write it with a script R there. There's different uh, notations you see around. If you Google around, you might see some people write R-A-N for range. You'll see other things also. I think script R is a compromise between um, uh, 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 writing it you know, relatively short and, and being relatively clear. So R makes it clear that it's a range, it seems to me, anyway. You sometimes see it denoted as H of V. You often see it denoted as H of V. That, uh, I prefer to do script R, but you will see it this some, sometimes. So I try to be in the habit of doing script R, but, uh, but everybody does it different, and you sometimes see H of V. I know that, strictly speaking, H is a map that takes in lowercase v's, that is, takes in elements of capital V, so there's a type issue here. But anyway, you often see this notation. The dimension of the range space is called the maps rank. You'll remember that we use the word rank for matrices. There'll be a connection later on. Okay, so here's, uh, here's a map that goes from the 2 by 2 matrices to the two tall vectors. A, B, C, D under the map is sent to A plus B and 2A plus 2B. I know that C and D never occur, but so what? That, that, that doesn't matter. The range space, then, you can see that the first line and second line are related here. The second line is twice the first line, so the range space is going to be all the vectors where the second component is twice the first. That is to say the familiar y is equal to twice x line. Okay, well, we know that that's a one-dimensional space because it's all the multiples of 1, 2. So the range space of this map is the line y equals x. So this shows that if you take a, if you take a two by two matrix, you get a you get a vector in the line through the origin, and this shows that every vector in the line through the origin is the image of some two by two matrix. Okay, another example. Just like to do a couple of examples of anything new that we see. The derivative map, the familiar derivative map. Take a derivative like calculus one derivative. It, uh, I'm I'm going from uh, fourth degree polynomials to fourth degree polynomials just to do an example of something. Uh, of course, everybody in, everybody knows, everybody watching this knows that the derivative of a fourth degree polynomial is a third degree polynomial. And uh, furthermore, if you give me a third degree polynomial, it's der the derivative of some fourth degree polynomial. Everybody has done antiderivatives too, I'm sure. So the rank of the derivative function is, is, uh, is the dimension of the cubic polynomials. And of course, the, the cubic polynomials, don't be misled by the subscript 3. The cubic polynomials are not dimension 3. The cubic polynomials are dimension 4 because you have constants, coefficients of x, coefficients of x squared, and coefficients of x cubed. There's sort of four degrees of freedom. Okay, another example. I'm going to talk a lot about the geometry here today. Another example is projection, oh, my darn pointer, projection from R3 to R2. So projection from three space to the plane. It's a linear map, and I'm not going to check that. The check is, check is perfectly routine. The range space is all of the plane, because when you, when you pick a vector in the plane, say the vector 5, 6, that's the projection of something? Oh, yeah, it's the projection of 5, 6, 1. It's the proje projection of 5, 6, 2. It's the projection of 5, 6, 3. In fact, there are infinitely many things that project down to 5, 6. So you can imagine if you stand on the point 5, 6 in the plane and look up, you see all those, all those points of that above you that project down. Or look down, you see all the points below you that project up. Okay, so the rank of the projection map is 2 because the, the, the output space, the, the range space, in this case the, the range of the entire map is, um, uh, uh, is two-dimensional. Okay, and we'll, later on, we'll do more examples uh, of determining the range space. We'll have a computational procedure for determining the range space that, that, that uh, as often in this class, we like to boil things down to a computational procedure. Okay, so uh, in moving from isomorphisms to homomorphisms, we drop the requirement that the maps be onto and one-to-one. -one. I'm going to argue that one of those requirements was not especially critical. Well, the other requirement, though, is. So the first is that onto is not especially critical because any homomorphism is onto its range. So dropping the onto condition has, in some way, no effect, no effect on the range anyway. It doesn't allow anything essentially new to happen. Everybody's got a range. But one-to-one, -one, 
is different. So in contrast, but the fact that we drop the one-to-one -one condition means that an output vector may have many associated inputs. That wasn't true for isomorphisms. So remember back for the previous slide, you're looking at the projection map and you're standing at 5, 6. You look up, there are many vectors that project to you. You look down, there are many vectors, infinitely many, of course, vectors that project to your location. So recall that if for any function, for example, for the projection function, the set of elements that map to a given one, for example, the set of vectors that project to 5, 6, the set of elements that map to a given one is called the inverse image. H superscript minus 1 doesn't mean 1 over, it means inverse image of W, lowercase w here, I'm standing at the point 5, 6. H superscript minus 1 of W is the set of these that, that H to W. So, if you imagine it's the projection map, it's the set of vectors up and down that project to you. Basically, it's the vertical line of vectors that go all the vectors whose tip is above you, all the vectors whose tip is below you, plus the vector you're on. I want to talk about the rest of today. I want to talk about the structure of the inverse image set because I think when a person first learns isomorphism and homomorphism, but more now homomorphism because we're focused on that, when a person learns homomorphisms, the, the, a person has to form kind of the right mental sort of uh, uh, skeleton on which to hang later sections. So what exactly is a homomorphism doing? And it helps to have a mental picture of what it's doing so that you can attach later ideas onto that mental picture. So that's our goal for the day. We've defined homomorphisms, we've done enough to do some homeworks on them, practice with them, and now we're trying to, trying to build up a mental conception of what it is that homomorphisms have to say. Okay, so here, a projection. Uh, from, in this case, it's going to go from R2 to R, just because I can draw them. I've got a bunch of vectors I can draw them. So pi of x, y is x. And uh, I have, have some colors, colors. <laughs> here are some elements of the inverse image of 2. So these are vectors that project down to 2. These, every one of these, I know is infinitely many, but I drew five. Five? Five. They all project down to two. In fact, there are ones below the x-axis, ones with negative y's, that project up to two, but I can only draw so many, I drew the ones I drew. Okay. These, the blue ones, are vectors that project down to three, or up to three, but I only drew the downs. Of course, two plus three makes five. <laughs> So, since I'm interested in preservation of addition, I'm going to look at the elements that project to 5. So, I'm thinking that red vectors and blue vectors combine to make uh, purple vectors. How do red vectors plus blue, ve blue vectors combine? What is happening there? Of course, that's going to be, that, that, that's going to be next. I'm interested in the preservation of addition condition because I'm interested in having a person build up a mental model of exactly what a homomorphism is. I know the definition tells you what a homomorphism is, but, but what kind of is it? You know, it's like if you give a person the definition of a fish and you never show them a fish, what, what kind of is it? Or if you give a person a definition of chess and you never tell them the, the, the ideas to capture the king. Well, what exactly does a homomorphism good for? What, what's it accomplish? Okay. So the point here is we'll take a red vector, a vector that maps to 2, and a blue vector, a vector that maps to 3, and when I, when I add, of course, pi of u, that gives me 2. When I, to pi of v, that gives me 3. I should get pi of u plus v, that's 5. So u plus v should be vectors that add to 5. So a vector that adds to 2 and a vector that adds to 3, if you were to combine those before mapping, you'd find that they added to 5. That is to say, a red vector plus a blue vector, and I just kind of picked one from the previous slide, a red vector plus a blue vector has to make a, I guess I called it magenta. <laughs> Looks purple to me, but magenta. A red, a red vector plus a blue vector makes a magenta vector, and uh, you can draw in the parallelogram diagram yourself. And the interpretation of preservation of scalar multiplication is it works exactly the same way, but but I'll let you I'll let you think that out through for yourself. So that is to say, what this equation tells us is that any red vector, any two vector, whatever that means, plus any blue vector, any three vector, any vector associated with three, 
makes a, a magenta vector, a vector associated with 5. 2 vector plus a 3 vector makes a 5 vector. Here's another example. Of course, one example of this size is not nearly enough. It's not projection. It's some little more complicated geometry. XY maps to X plus Y to X plus 2Y. A person does notice that the second component is twice the first. So all of these here uh, are, are, uh, uh, are vectors that the outcomes are going to be vectors that are multiples of 1, 2. Okay? So, uh, so here, for example, are, uh, are, are the, the, the vectors that multiply to 1, 2. Excuse me, the vectors that map to 1, 2. Vectors in the plane that map to 1, 2. Okay? Here, so it's that, oh, the, the, the dots. Here are the vectors that map to 1.53 all the blue dots. Every vector that maps to 1.53 lies on that line. Just like every vector that mapped to 1, 2 lies on that line. And then there's the map, and then it's going to 1, 2. Here, these are the vectors that map to 1.53, and I chose 1.53 because I didn't want it to get too big. <laughs> it fell off my screen. Maps to, maps to 1.53. And you get the idea, right? A red vector plus a, here, a red vector plus a blue vector, it's going to map to a magenta vector. What are the magenta vectors? 2.55. It's all the vectors that map to 2.55. Where did the 2.5 and 5 come from? 1 plus 1.5 makes 2.5. 2 plus 3 makes 5. A red vector plus a blue vector makes a magenta vector. That is to say, this map breaks the domain up into these diagonal lines, the red line, the blue line, the magenta line. All the vectors that are in the same diagonal line are in the same category. They're all red vectors, or they're all blue vectors, or they're all magenta vectors. They all map to the same output. And the point of preservation of addition is that any red vector plus any blue vector makes any magenta vector. That is to say, there's a structure on, on this broken up domain. Another example. Here's a red vector, blue vector, and magenta vector from the previous slide, and we see them adding there. I don't know how well the parallelogram shows up on, on your screen, but there's a, there's a kind of a ghostly parallelogram in my diagram. In any event, you can eyeball it that there's a parallelogram that any red vector plus any blue vector makes a magenta vector. If, for example, I had chosen a different blue vector like this one here, why, I would get a very long and skinny parallelogram that would end with a magenta vector here. So I am breaking the domain up into parts, breaking the domain up into parts. And those parts, it, it, our red part, the blue part, the, the, the magenta part, I'm breaking those vectors into categories. Okay, so H of red plus H of blue is H of, can I call it red plus blue? Magenta. So that is to say, one of the lessons that, that that we want to take away from homomorphisms, not just the definition, but a first idea of what it is they do. Homomorphisms organize the domain. The intuition is that linear maps organize the domain into inverse images in such a way that the sets reflect the structure of the range. Red plus blue makes magenta. So what do I mean by organize the domain into inverse images? Well, remember when we looked at projection from R3 to R2 and you stood on 5 comma 6, and you looked up and looked down, those are all the vectors associated with your current location. If, you're, if you paint your current location red, all of those vectors would become red. Similarly, you move over a little bit, you stand at some spot, you paint it blue, all those vectors become blue. What happens if you add red plus blue? Why, you get magenta. All those vectors become magenta. That is drawn here in my crude way, that this is the inverse image of some vector v, excuse me, vector w from the, from, from the, the codomain. 
This is the inverse image of some vector, another vector w from the codomain. This is the inverse image of another vector w from the codomain. I drew it as these vertical dots because I'm generalizing that picture of you're standing on 5, 6, and you'll look up and look down. Okay. Here's my projection example. So x, y, z goes to x, y. We draw the range as the xy plane. Technically, I should draw them as two separate places, but it, there, there's a temptation to, to, to make the picture look a certain way. So I put the, the out, outcome space over here in this diagram over here. Oops, there we go. Ah, I went too far. I have the output space and the input space drawn separately. I, I, I really should do that in this picture, but, but, but forgive me. I, I put the output space inside the input space, and I hope it doesn't cause confusion. And again, the idea is that uh, a, a, a red vector plus a blue vector makes a magenta vector. There is the inverse image of the red vectors, the inverse image of the blue vectors, and the inverse image of the magenta vectors. The best I can draw. I'm not a very good drawer. If you pick any vector, any vector, I don't know, what are there, 10 dots there? Any vector from the inverse image of the red vectors. And any vector plus the inver from the inverse image of the blue vector, if you pick the bottom one here and the top one there, that should add to a, a, a vector from the inverse image of the magenta vectors. So again, homomorphisms divide the output space, the range, into components. One component, two components, three components. And those components have a structure. They act in a way that reflects the structure of the domain. Red plus blue makes magenta. Okay. Whoops, what happened? Oh, uh, I went too far. Forgive me. <laughs> oh, that's annoying. There we go. I'm finally back to where I want to be. There we go. I don't know what happened. I hit a button and something went, something went crazy. So do you remember I was just here before I hit the button and it went crazy? Maybe I hit the end button instead of the down button. And now I have a red vector plus a blue vector makes a magenta vector. Okay. This interpretation of the definition of homomorphism also holds for spaces that I can't, that I'm, that I'm not going to be able to draw because I don't, you know, I, I'm not able to draw, for example, the quadratic polynomials. This, so, or at least I'm not very able to draw them very well. But if I take three members of the output space, where w1 plus w2 makes w3, and I look at the inverse image of w1, it's all of those, uh, all those quadratic polynomials um, th that, you know, that lie in this set here. If I take the inverse image of w2, it's all the quadratic polynomials that lie in this set here. And then the inverse image of W3 is all the quadratic polynomials that lie in this set here. Okay, so uh, so the inverse image of W1 is you got to have a 1 in that B place. The inverse image of W2 is you got to have a minus 1 in the B place. And the inverse image of W3 is you got to have a 0 in the B place. Coefficient of x. And any member of any member of the h inverse of w1, any that say any quadratic polynomial that has a 1 in the x place, coefficient of x, plus any member of the, in, of the inverse image of w2, any quadratic polynomial that has a minus 1 in front of x, adds to a, a member of w3, of h inverse of w3. If you take a 7x squared plus 1x plus 9, and, and, you, and you add 16x squared minus 1x plus 4, you'll get somebody, I lost track of what I said, but it'll have a 0 in front of x. Okay, and um, it, it, in each of those examples, the homomorphism shows how to view the domain as organized into inverse images. When we come back next time, this has been a long time, long day today. When we come back next time, we're going to see, we're going to understand what those inverse images are. It's related to what's called the null space, the inverse image of, of the origin. Okay, so, so we started off by talking about the range space today. Homomorphisms organize the range space into these inverse image in such a way that the inverse images have a structure. 
and next time we're asking the question, what do the inverse images look like? Okay, so of course that'll be part two. Very good. We'll see you then.